thank you, and in particular, thank you to the organizers for this wonderful uh, meeting. Uh, you know, I don't have uh, uh, experiences with philosophers uh, too often, and this has been uh, so far an excellent uh, experience. So, thank you very much for making this possible. Uh, in fact, you know. Uh, after attending two days of, 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 of this uh, conference, I decided to modify a little bit my talk and try to adapt it to the audience here. Most of them are philosophers, so I try to make the, the presentation less technical, more general. So I apologize for the experts in, in the room. But you know, these are the advantages of speaking the last day, that you have time to accommodate and talk to the, to the audience. I haven't even changed the title. Uh, so my, now my title is the pre-inflationary universe, quantum gravity and the CMB. And the starting point is the, is the discussion that we had on Monday after Chris uh, talks. Uh, uh, over there, uh, we agreed that inflation, you know, is a very nice paradigm to account for the origin of the cosmic structures in what I think is a quite economical way and also elegant because, you know, the origin is found in quantum fluctuations the quantum notion of nothingness, uh, so it's a very <coughs> compelling intellectually. But we also agree that there are many questions that are still open and we want to address them. So let me just summarize uh, or remember, recall uh, so, some of them. You know, what is the matter field or whatever driven inflation? Uh, if it is a scalar field, what is the potential that is causing the slow roll uh, inflationary expansion? How does inflation begin and, and, and what, what is the initial conditions of inflation you know, for perturbations and for the space-time geometry? What happens before inflation? How is the space-time described over there? Is there a big bang singularity or something else happens? Uh, if there is a quantum space-time before inflation, uh, how does the smooth geometry that we describe in GR emerges from, from, from first principles? The same for matter fields. How matter fields, for instance, uh, perturbations, scalar and tensor fields, propagate on a quantum space-time, and how the familiar picture of quantum field theory in a curved background emerges from quantum gravity. And also a very important question: Does this evolution, you know, the pre-inflationary evolution, can leave any imprint in the CMB, or rather, the universe forgets about whatever happens before inflation? So the goal of my talk is twofold. On the one hand, I want to consider a concrete proposal for the pre-inflationary universe and try to see what that proposal can answer and what it cannot. So far, we have discussed, in particular on Monday, these questions on general grounds, but I think it's very informative to consider a single proposal and see what we can answer and what we cannot. And the second part of my talk will have to do with the last item. And, and I think this is very important because I am a physicist, so after all, what I want to, see, to do is to explore consequences and contrast them with observations. So let me uh, start from the first uh, part. So the concrete proposal I'm going to consider is loop quantum cosmology, which has been discussed before uh, uh, in this conference. And the reason I want to choose this is just because I have more experience here uh, regarding if this is, if I believe if this is the right theory or not, I mean, that is completely irrelevant. You know, we are physicists, we have to explore everything we can and contrast with observations. So I'm going to focus on this because I know it better and also because I think uh, the main assumptions are clear, so it is to me transparent what you can learn or what you cannot from this, from this uh, formula. So I'm going to summarize in 10 minutes the work of many people, so I will be quite general. We'll forget about details. So first, let me tell you what loop quantum cosmology is. I think a good summary is that this is loop quantum cosmology is the first man version of loop quantum gravity. So loop quantum gravity is an approach to quantize gravity in general, but it is not complete. You know, if you try to quantize an arbitrary gravitational field, there are many ambiguities that we don't know how to solve yet. But, you know, what about if we try to be less ambitious? If we try to quantize only space-times with the symmetry of cosmology, homogeneous and isotropic gravitational configurations. 
they have much less degrees of freedom, just a bunch of them, and therefore many of the ambiguities of the full theory can be clarified there, and one can obtain a quantum gravity of the cosmos. This is what true quantum cosmology is, quantizing only those degrees of freedom of the gravitational field that are homogeneous and isotropic, and freezing the rest. Of course, you know, simplifications always come together with limitations. And by freezing many degrees of freedom, you may miss important physical aspects. Is that the case? I mean, we don't know because we don't have the full theory. But the hope is that, you know, Luke Quantum Cosmology captures the essence of the physics of the early universe. You know, a good example that I like to use is the hydrogen atom. When Dirac quantized the hydrogen atom, he imposed a spherical symmetry, a priori. So he was only considering photons, you know, fluctuations of the electromagnetic field that are spherically symmetric. And uh, he described the atom with good accuracy. But later on, people realized that if you consider, you know, other fluctuations, there are extra effects, like the lamp shift, that cannot be captured in a spherical symmetry. And Dirac said, okay, I mean, this is very nice, but, you know, still my model was simple enough, and it captures mainly uh, the main physics of the problem. The hope is that something similar is happening with Luke quantum cosmology. Also, this is not a unifying theory. So the goal of this approach is modest. It's just trying to see if we can quantize gravity in a self-consistent manner. And, and after that, to see what constraints that quantization imposes in matter fields and, and continue from that. What about the matter content? That was discussed in Mary uh, talks quite explicitly. Uh, in Luke Quantum Cosmology, there is no preferred matter, there is no emergent matter, nothing like that. One has to impose, to introduce by hand matter fields. And we do the same as normally done in cosmology. You know, consider a scalar field and choose a potential by hand. There is no motivation from the theory what potential we should use. So there is freedom in that. The theory, you know, classically, the degrees of freedom are just two if we consider Freeman, Robertson Walker, especially flat. One coming from gravity, the scale factor of the FRW metric, and the scalar field from matter. Just one degree of freedom because this is a uniform, homogeneous scalar field. Quantum gravitationally, you know, in the, in the quantum level, these classical uh, fields are, you know, variables are described by a wave function. So we have a Hilbert space made of wave functions of, of, that depend on A and phi. So in particular, there is no smooth geometry, there is no smooth metric. All, all what we have is a probability distribution in the quantum sense of several metrics. Like you know, like in quantum mechanics, a particle doesn't have a well-defined trajectory, the same here. The evolution of the universe doesn't have a well-defined metric all the time. You just have a wave function evolving, and you can compute probabilities, and, and observables, of course, expectation values. So these this wave functions satisfies an equation, which is the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, that is a generic equation in quantum gravity. The Hamiltonian operator needs to annihilate the quantum state. And that can be written explicitly in something like this. And what I have done here is, you know, this Hamiltonian depends on, 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 on matter and geometry. The, depends on, the dependence on matter has a term, which is the kinetic term, is quadratic in the conjugate momentum of the field. But the conjugate momentum in the field representation is just derivative of the field. So P squared here becomes second derivative of the, of the field, and the rest I call it theta. And I write it in this way because, you know, this looks like a Clay gordon equation if you think about this as the time derivative and this as the special Laplacian. So, um, and the solutions to these equations are, are from the Hilbert space, and that is the quantum theory. And, of course, this is a frozen theory, you know, in gravity, you know, in quantum gravity, there is no time in the theory a priori. So this is a theory of histories, and there is no natural way of interpreting that history as an evolution in any way. <coughs> However, one can recover the familiar time evolution from this frozen uh, uh, theory by, you know, looking at this expression and say, okay, what about if I interpret phi as a clock, as a time, and I study 
relational evolution. How matter degrees of freedom, sorry, how, how gravitational degrees of freedom evolve relatively to matter degrees of freedom. So this is this convenient to interpret if you want. You don't need to do it, but if you want, you can recover an evolution thinking about flying as a clock. You know, this is time a la limit. Time emerges in a relational uh, manner. Just a question, is, is here a commitment made to many world interpretation? Mm, no. Why? Well, because you're saying you're going to talk about relational, this relational way function in which, in some sense, you imagine there being... I can only imagine this probability in, 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 in this way by thinking that there are, you know, multiple realizations and each one corresponds to one particular scalar field. In other words, the scalar field doesn't take any value. Here is exactly the same as we do in quantum mechanics. Imagine you have two oscillators, x and y, and this is a function of the two of them. If you want, you can interpret some part of the theory as, as using one of them as a reference and see how it evolves to the other. And there is a whole theory of how to do that in a self-consistent manner. There is no more assumptions than the standard quantum mechanics regarding the interpretation. As I said, solutions to this equation for the Hilbert space, and we can answer questions. Another discussion we had on Monday is that, you know, this theory, you have a Hilbert space, as you have for an harmonic oscillator. The theory doesn't tell you what is the state of the universe. So the best you can do is to take observations today, choose a solution today that is picked in a classical configuration, and evolve back in time to reproduce the past history of the universe. The theory, so far, doesn't tell you what is the state of the universe. You have a Hilbert space of possible states, as we have in any other theory of, 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 of modern physics. So let me summarize consequences very fast. The main consequences are the following. This is a sort of theorem, and is that every single physical observable, you know, energy density, uh, pressure of the matter field, uh, curvature invariance, they all are bounded above in the entire Hilbert space. No observable blows that in the entire Hilbert space. And this is the mathematical sense in which there is no Big Bang singularity. For instance, energy density, is bounded above, above by a sub-value, sub which is a fraction of the Planck uh, scale, and curvature is also bounded above by a fraction of the Planck scale. Nothing, you know, they, there is no single state in which they blow that. Blow that. Additionally, regarding evolution, all states in this framework go through an instant, if you want, instant in, in five uh, picture, of minimum volume and maximum curvature. So in this framework, one finds that every single state that we take today and evolve back in time suffers a bounce when the energy density is maximum and the curvature is maximum. So here, if we go back in time, time goes vertically, future and past. If we are here, we go back in time. In GR, space-time ends at the Big Bang singularity. Here, rather, one finds that the universe bounces. And therefore, there is a contracting branch of the universe and an expanding branch of the universe, both described by GR and joined together by a quantum phase in which the geometry itself is quantum mechanical. To get more intuition about the geometry, because you know it is quantum and it is difficult to imagine, one can follow the peak of the wave function. Just take the expectation value of the skill factor and see and recover effective equations to describe that, you know, semi-classical equations. And this is what you find. You find the Friedman equation, which is very similar to the GR, except for this new term. The right Hidoubi equation, which is similar to GR except for these two terms, and the same equation for the scalar field. Dot here means derivative with respect to a parameter I call T. It's a mathematical parameter at this level. Remember initially what I had was the scale factor and the scalar field evolving relative to each other. Now I am breaking apart this relation by introducing a parameter t, and it happens that there is a choice of t for which these equations are true. So and that is the way in which t appears, and now you know you have a smooth metric, and it happens that t can be interpreted as a time-like uh, variable. And you can see this term 
that whenever energy density of matter is well below the Planck scale, this term is 1, and you recover gr. But if rho becomes close to the Planck scale, 1 minus 1 is 0, h is 0, that is the Hubble rate, Hubble rate equals 0, signals the transition from contraction to expansion, and there is a dance. So this is the term that in this effective equation signals the existence of the dance. And gr is recovered whenever rho is much smaller than the Planck uh, scale, as you could imagine just from general grants. What about inflation? Can this bouncing scenario be compatible with inflation? Again, I'm going to be short here. The answer is yes. And in fact, it's difficult to avoid inflation if you have a scalar field and a suitable potential. Let me argue why. Let me argue just using the example of a quadratic potential, but it's the same for any other potential. Inflation happens whenever you start with the field high in the potential and you live there. The field will start rolling down, and that is inflation, very slowly because you have Hubble friction that makes the field to slowly roll down. But you know, what about if in the past, before the bounce, the scalar field is not high in the potential? If the scalar field is in the bottom of the potential, how inflation is going to start? Well, it happens that in the contracting branch, H is negative. So this is anti-friction rather than friction. And this anti-friction kicks the field up in the potential. Even if it's initially low, after, you know, when you get close to the bounce, H becomes very negative, and the field naturally will go up in the potential. Then you go to the expand, expanding phase, anti-friction because friction, the field slowly stops, and then inflation starts. And if you do the analysis, uh, you know, it happens that it's quite difficult to avoid a, a phase of inflation after the bounce. Again, if you have an inflationary potential. So only if you have inflationary potential, inflation will happen. But that's a big if. If you have an inflationary potential. Right? Yeah. There are all these tuning conditions. Right, you need an inflationary potential, of course. I think I was quite clear on that. that, that you need to put that by hand, and there is no... So far, there is no natural candidate in the sector. I mean, people are looking for it to see if that can come from geometry. You know, if you can extend the action and have higher correlative correction that can act as a scalar field, a la Stalovinsky, but so far, there is no... This will come only if you take into account the full field. Right. Because if this mean super space approach, by default, is not going to exist. I mean, you, I mean, you could have from the full theory... Yeah, from the full theory. Right. So that so you could inspire you from the full theory. What is lacking is the connection between the two. Right, right. And, you know, and a majority of the work today in the community goes on that direction. In fact, there are a few concrete ways of taking the full theory, taking a coherent state in the full theory, peak on a homogeneous <coughs> space-time, derive the effective, you know, the effective Hamiltonian of this coherent state, and one reproduces the... So, you know, the efforts are on that uh, I know, line. But if, I, if I can make a comment, then uh, with respect to the, to the, sorry, with respect to the uh, talk that uh, Daniele gave yesterday of group field theory, group field cosmology, there we have shown that the way that you make, you glue your, your, your quantum geometry, so how they interact with each other, this can give you a gravitational way of having, I mean, a geometrical way of having inflation. By inflation, I mean exponential expansion. I don't mean inflation through a scalar field. So something similar could come from the full theory here. I agree. What is the full theory, of course? Mm -hmm. no, I, 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 I very much agree that with the limitations, but I also like to emphasize that you know, even though you have limitations, one is learning uh, many good lessons, and this opens the possibility to go beyond that at some point. Okay, so this is the picture that we have uh, on that uh, on, from this theory. There is a contracting pre-bounce phase of the universe, uh, in which is described by classical general relativity. You are far from the Planck regime, so you have a smooth metric, and GR works very well. Then, you, when you approach the Planck uh, scale, then quantum gravitational effects uh, kick on. Uh, they overwhelm the classical attraction and produce a bounce. And after that, energy density falls off again, and you recover GR. There is a pre-inflationary phase, and if you have a scalar field and a potential, inflation will, will start. Or something that acts like a scalar field and a potential, inflation will, 
will, will start. And this is the picture I will, I will consider uh, from now on. So what about perturbations? So regarding perturbations, one needs to go beyond and add to the freeman robertson walker wave function add perturbations, a scalar and tensor, and one needs to quantize them in tandem. So now you need to do, you need to do a theory of both. Uh, I, again, I'm going to summarize, just give you the final uh, result, is that if you assume that perturbations are really perturbations, so are just test fields that do not modify the background geometry, that do not back react strongly on the geometry, then one can show that the quantum evolution for perturbations is mathematically equivalent, can be rewritten mathematically as klein gordon like equations. Where the metric appearing in this box is not a solution of GR, of course, it's just a smooth metric that one can build from the wave function of the universe, and, 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 and you know, and it contains H bar on it. And it happens that it satisfies the effective equations I was showing you before. So again, in this framework, the evolution of perturbations interacting with the quantum geometry mathematically is equivalent to a classical evolution, with the only point is that the metric featured in here is built from the quantum geometry. And to me, that is quite interesting, because uh, on the one hand, at the level of the wave function, you know, uh, no, questions like causality, local Lorentz invariant are not really well defined. You know, you have a wave function, what do you mean by causality? What do you mean by local Lorentz invariant? You know. However, when you put perturbations, effective metric appears for matter fields. And in this effective metric, you can see that there is local Lorentz invariance, that a causal structure appears for perturbations. So perturbations feel themselves as in a, in a regular smooth matrix, even though the space time itself is not, is not smooth. Go ahead. What is this psi field? This is, this is the, the wave function of uh, what I mentioned before. This is, I don't know what it is. This is the, the wave function that describes the freeman robertson walker geometry. So this is a function of the scale factor and the scalar field. And this is what describes quantum mechanically the freeman robertson walker gravitational field. So now I am adding... a function of two variables, a and phi. Exactly. And you, you perturb it? Uh... You perturb it. Now you have fields, because these guys are, 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 are inhomogeneous, so they have infinitely many degrees of freedom. So, so you now have like spatial degrees of freedom now? Because it, right. it used to be just one spatial degree of freedom. Right, now you have a spatial degrees of freedom. You deviate... I can think of a space-time now, you mean? Exactly. So, okay. so, so you deviate from freeman robertson walker slightly by having perturbations. The, the standard approach is you have a scalar and two tensor degrees of freedom, the plus and cross, cross polarizations, and they are fields propagating on this space time. And what I said is that the result of a calculation is that these fields propagate at the practical level, at the mathematical level, as if they were in a smooth metric that you can build in a precise manner from the, from the quantum uh, state of the geometry. So it seems you. You, you now have a metric which wasn't there before. Right. Before the you, just have a, you just have a wave function. And, uh... Exactly. The metric is emerging. You realize that the, the evolution of the perturbations is as if they were seen a metric. All the information about... This metric is classical or...? No, it doesn't follow classical equations. They follow the effective equations I was showing. Well, it's a classical field, right? It's a smooth metric, a freeman robertson walker metric that follows these equations, not geometry. It's a bit unclear because you start with a quantum theory, now you have a smooth uh, you know, right. fixed value right. classical exactly. metric. Exactly, but that is the non-triviality of the, of the calculation. But as a result of the analysis, one finds, quite surprisingly, that the evolution of perturbations, which is complicated, you know, can be rewritten as if there is a smooth metric. So for, for, from the point of view of perturbations, they cannot differentiate between a smooth metric and the quantum geometry, precisely because they are perturbations. If but, you include that reactor, that is not any more. Sorry, but I, I guess the question is, what is the framework from which the equations for Q and T are obtained? Right. This is what I didn't show you. <laughs> so this is what, 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 what is encoded here. So, so, so the statement is that you start from, from Lu quantum cosmology. From the beginning, you have both now, background and perturbations. You start from the beginning. You quantize everything in tandem and you get a theory of both interacting with each other. If in that theory you neglect back reaction, 
you continue, and at the end of the day, as a result of a long calculation, you find these equations. So that is the, the, the so result. So this is a full loop quantum gravity calculation. Uh, not completely, because you are neglecting back reactions, so you don't need, I mean, one is not really quantizing a la loop the perturbation. You don't really need that. But you treat both quantum mechanically, perturbations and the back reactions. Of course, you know, your questions are well posed because I am just giving you the result. I haven't shown anything. So you have to believe me at this point or discuss with me later. So I would, I would add that it is nothing specific in this approach is it just for the same time when we consider uh, e quantum, e e quantum effects and quantum electrodynamics in the background in the background of the storm fields so it's the same in effect it's the same so once more I want to emphasize that in this point, but there is nothing that's specific, especially specifically to the loop quantum gravity. Loop quantum gravity only shows itself in the new e equations for the background, but the uh, e generic method is the same. Thank you. And nevertheless, to me, it was surprising that starting from the full quantum calculation, at the end, you can reach equations using back neglecting back reactions that look like a field theory, but you initially didn't have a field theory. And an effective matrix appears. So it seems that there's a conceptual shift, because you start with the quantum theory, your predictions are probabilities, and now, somehow, you do some calculation, and then probabilities disappear, you have a, like a classical metric. Like, how is the shift made? I mean, you still have probabilities, because you know, the fields are, are quantum. But they propagate as if they were in a classical, uh, well-determined, so this is not you're fixing on a, a fixed classical right, space. Again, 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 where does it arise? It is, it is the result of the fact that, that, that perturbations cannot test every single aspect of the geometry. Because they are perturbations. So they only see a few moments of the quantum geometry. And these moments happen to be, uh, can be encoded mathematically in a smooth metric. We can discuss more in the discussion in the session. So then we can come back to the list of questions. You know, what is the scalar field and the potential? This theory doesn't give you an answer about that. How does inflation begin and what are the initial conditions? Inflation begins, as I, as I said, after the downs. The evolution brings the inflaton field high in the potential, if there is a potential, and inflation begins. And then you can propagate perturbations across the bounds and compute what is the initial state of perturbations at the beginning of inflation. What happens before inflation? I described that. Uh, how is space time described? Uh, is there a big bang? The answer is no. Uh, is there a quantum space time? The answer is yes. How does a smooth classical geometry emerge? It emerges globally at late times, whenever the quantum effects uh, fall off. And for perturbations, uh, also because this effective metric that perturbations fill go to a FRW uh, uh, solution at late times. And Perturbations propagate in a pre-inflationary universe, as I described. And the last question, does this evolution leave any imprint in the CMB? That is the starting point of the second part of, of, of the talk. So again, my goal was to, you know, because all these questions were discussed uh, in the first day, was to give you a summary, short summary, of the results that the concrete approach uh, uh, provides. Okay. So regarding if we can leave any imprint in the CMB, so uh, here I'm going to explore a possibility or an idea that is going to answer this question in the affirmative. And the idea is that there are some features that we see in the CMB called large scale anomalies, I will describe in a second, and that this is our remains of the pre-inflationary universe, of whatever happens before inflation. That is the proposal, and let's try to see that. I can make sense of that. So, sorry, can, can you state again what's the state of your, of your quantum fields characterizing the perturbations? They, they, yes. So what you do, you rather than you have these equations for perturbations, which at the end of the day, they are, they are like a fog field living on a 
given uh, yeah. geometry. Mm -hmm. So now, rather this, than starting the evolution at the onset of inflation, assuming the uh, adiabatic vacuum there, I go to the past. And I put initial conditions, you know, adiabatic vacuum in the past. Where in the past? There are two natural places, either the bounds. But, it, but it's a vacuum. It's an adiabatic vacuum. It's an adiabatic vacuum, either at the bounds or you go to the far past. Uh, I like more the second option, going to the far past and choosing a vacuum state there where modes are really elevated, really inside the, the, the curvature scale. And then you evolve them across the bounds and, and, and up to the onset of inflation. But if you start with the vacuum, the elevated vacuum, then you're facing the same problem we were discussing yesterday, right? right? The point is that in inflation, when you do that, you don't really know what happens before inflation. Your picture is not complete. So you say, okay, I start evolution here, I don't know what happens, I want to assume that nothing happens of importance before inflation. Here you have a complete picture. So you can go to the past, to the infinite past if you want, and put initial conditions there and see and see what happens. Right, but the issue of homogeneity of the, of the original yes, state of is course. still there, right? I mean, here, obviously, yes, because I am in loop quantum cosmology, which is a mini super space quantization. So I am assuming exact homogeneity from the beginning. And there is no limitation, of course. One has to go beyond that. But, but this is step by step process. So absolutely. I... OK. Robert has a question. OK, so let me tell you what this large term means. Okay. I can use some time to question. Yeah. So, what are these? Let me just summarize quickly what, what they are. So, they are essentially features that we see in the CMB and they are in tension with the lambda CDM model. And let me tell you what tension means. Uh, so, um, uh, there are three of them I want to discuss. Uh, main, uh, the, main, the main ones are a lack of correlations, also called power suppression. Dipolar or hemispherical asymmetry and odd parity preference. And they only appear in correlation functions at large angles in the CMB. When you consider points which are highly separated in the CMB, and for that reason they are called large scale anomalies. So, first let me tell you why they are called anomalies. Anomalies is kind of mild work. Why they are not called inconsistencies or something stronger. And the reason is that, uh, you know, because they are not incompa really incompatible with the lambda CDM model. They are just unusual in the statistical sense. Remember that what the lambda CDM model can do for us is predict a probability distribution. That's it. And we see one CMB, and we need to extract from the CMB information about the probability distribution. So in a good analogy is imagine that you have an harmonic oscillator in the ground state, and you measure quantum harmonic oscillator, and you measure the oscillator once, and you find it three sigmas away from the mean. Would you say that your theory is incorrect? Uh, no, because, you know, the ground, the ground state is a Gaussian, and if you compute the probability, you know, it tells you that if you measure a thousand times, one of them will catch the oscillator there. So this is something very similar. So we catch the CMB with some effects, which are not incompatible, but are three sigmas away from what we expect from the theory. Now is our, our, you know, uh, we can decide if we call that, uh, you know, and, and a call for new physics or not, or it's just a statistical excursion of the, of the degrees of freedom. So the plan collaborator, collaboration quantifies that by using the p-value. The p-value is the following. Take the probability distribution predicted by the lambda CDM model. Put that in a computer and simulate a large number of CMBs. And now compute what is the percentage of realizations of, of realizations showing a feature as extreme as the one that we see. That is called the p-value. If the p-value is very small, we call that an anomaly. So, first, lack of correlations. The statement, in short, here I have to summarize, is that if you compute the amount of correlations at low L's, angular multiples, there is a 10% less than we, what, we what we expect from lambda CDM. 
But people realize that this power suppression is way more clear if you go to real space, not to, not to L space, but to angular space. So consider the two-point function of temperature between two directions separated by an angle theta. Measure that in the CMB. The dotted line is what CM, lambda CDM predicts. And this color lines is what we measure. So you can see here a clear lack of correlations compared to the lambda CDM predictions. And even here you can see anti-correlations compared to the lambda CDM. black line is what we see is the black line or the red line? Both, because these are different ways of measuring the CMB. They have to mask the galaxy, and these are two different cars with different... You have the full sky, mask, and mask. Sorry, the green range? The green range is the one, uh, I think it's one sigma error bars or two sigma error bars, I don't remember. From lambda CDM. From lambda CDM. So the way that they quant quantify this deviation is by computing the total amount of correlations between 60 and 100 degrees. I mean, you take C squared and you integrate from here to here. This was uh, what people call S1 half, was proposed by Spergel in WMAP, and that is just C square integrating from 180 degrees to 60 degrees. And Lambda CDM predicts 42,000, we measure 1,500. <coughs> the p-value is less than 1%, and that is a deviation over three signals. Okay, excuse me, I want to only add a question. Carrying uh, uh, area, it's not observational errors, this cosmic variance. What is, what is, what is, this, the green area? In that plot, I am not sure if it's cosmic variance. Uh, it's cosmic variance. Dipolar or hemispherical asymmetry. So the fact is that observations find a dipole superposed to the, to the CMB, to the homogene, to the isotropic CMB. A dipole on the top of that. That has been seen in all W map, map in, in W map and also in Planck maps. And the way they quantify that is the following. Consider the most generic angular two-point function in the CMB. If the universe is isotropic, that is diagonal. So you only have this term, delta L1, L2, delta L1, L2. Any other non-diagonal terms in these levels are anisotropic. You can expand them using klebs gordon coefficients, and what you get in front of it, the number is called bipolar spherical harmonic coefficients, and they encode information about anisotropies. And they are labeled by some number, capital L and capital M, so we speak about dipolar, anisotropy, quadrupolar, octopolar, etc., etc. And they, again, they produce correlations between L1 and L2. And the statement is that they measure a non-zero value of the dipole, L equal 1, of this dipolar modulation. That is different from the dipole here, L equal 1. That is different. This is a, a modulation that entangles L1 and L2. They have measured a non-zero value for L1, but only for a small Ls. So the results are here. Planck satellite, only for L is more than, two, uh, than 64. They find this parameter, they call it here A, of the order of 0.07, and they claim a p-value is more than percent, and they say that if such signal had been predicted, this is uh, an observation, you know, this is a detection at three sigma level. And just the last, so one, one thing more, they don't see any quadruple, they don't see any octopole, they only see a dipole at large scale. This is what they see. <coughs> Odd parity. The statement here, just to simplify, is that you can separate all the L's in odd and even multiples, and they see... Uh, so, can you clarify something? Uh, my, my simple understanding of how measurements are done is, the first thing you do when you take the satellite data is you subtract the dipole and it interpret it as characterizing our peculiar motion. Right. But so, how is there a dipole left? Right. Be because the scale dependence is different. You know what is the Doppler dipole that has a very concrete scale dependence, and you know how to subtract it. And even after subtracting that, you see a remanent, uh, which is what, what they say. So they are able to separate both lines. Sorry, what, what do you mean scale dependence? That this dipole only appears for, for a small multiple. Only appears at large scales. Doesn't appear at the smallest scale. 
So the, don't confuse that L small L equal two, sorry, small L equal one, the dipole, with big L equal one. It's not the same. This is a modulation that entangles L1 and L2. This is only the dipole of the, of the isotropic part. They are different things. So this is a dipole on the top of the isotropic symmetry. And they are, they are able to separate that from the Doppler dipole. So they see more power in odd than in even multiples. And there is a signal of, of parity breaking. And it's of the same order, a bit less than three signals. How much time do I have? One minute. One minute. <laughs> okay. So this is the viewpoint that the Planck satellite in the last paper, Legacy, uh, uh, take about these uh, uh, observations. So you can read it yourself. I will give you one minute <laughs> to read it. <laughs> no more than that. Uh, And then I will use one more minute to summarize um, the last part of the talk that I don't have time to cover. Okay, so so this I am very much agree with this viewpoint. We don't know what they are, if they are just signals of new physics or not, and we should explore possibilities and see if they if, if we don't find anything uh, interesting, then this is what we have. Okay. So the statement I want to make is that, um, and, and you know, and they are, people have tried a lot, and they are very difficult to account for, these anomalies, because they are scale dependent. They only appear at large angles uh, in correlations, and it is not easy at all to, to, to produce them without violating something else. And, and, and the statement here I want to make is that I believe a bounce happening before inflation gives you a mechanism to generate the three of them simultaneously, and scale dependent, in a concrete manner that I will explain or not, depending on the kindness of the chair. <laughs> so the statement, the mechanism that I think um, uh, I want to use is what people call non-Gaussian modulation. And the statement is, is that if the probability distribution, primordial distribution, is non-Gaussian, <laughs> then, certain features in the CMB, like uh, suppression, like a dipole, etc., appear much more often. So deviations from the mean, the variance of these features to appear, is much larger. So in a typical realization, you should see you should see many new effects uh, quite commonly if the spectrum is non-Gaussian. So again, these non-Gaussianity are not modifying the mean value if you measure many CMBs. But are telling you that you should expect uh, uh, deviations from the mean much more frequently than if the primordial spectrum is Gaussian. Of course, now you need to explain me where these non-Gaussianities are coming from, because we don't see them in the CMB. So Planck goes, you know, this idea is nice, but if you go to the CMB, there are no non-Gaussianities. So you need to provide me a model for non-Gaussianities that doesn't contradict the fact that we don't see them in the CMB, and at the, uh, at the same time, are strong enough to produce these effects. And the statement that they want to make is that a bounce can produce that. The re you know, in summary, I'm, I'm finishing, is that a bounce, you know, if, again, if the length of inflation is not too large, then it happens, when it happens that the bounce is able to generate long, you know, a strong non-Gaussianities, between modes that are the bound, and the bounds are half wavelength longer than the scale of the bounds, you know, wavelength longer than that. Then, if the length of inflation is not too large, it happens that these non Gaussianities produced by the bounds appear today between the longest wavelength we can measure and even longer super hollow scales. So, the longest wavelength we can measure can be highly correlated, highly entangled with super horizon scales if there is a bounce and the length of inflation is not too large. So we don't see this non-Gaussianity directly because they involve super horizon scales. But an analysis that I don't have time to cover and is the rest of my talk is that these uh, non-Gaussianities have precisely the right form to produce quite often a suppression 
only at large scales, together with uh, uh, dipole modulation, with no quadrupole, because the quadrupole turns out to be very small, and with also with a, with a parity kind of, of, of anomaly. So this, again, these correlations between long wavelength and even longer wavelength can impact our CMB, producing in many realizations uh, features that look like this, this anomaly. I wish I had more time to you know, go over the details, but I don't. So let me close it up, and, 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 and I am open for questions. Okay. Yeah, so I just have a comment. So uh, these features that you just discussed at the end, that a bounce produces, uh, low, can produce a low end suppression, that was first worked out by a group in China, uh, Yifu Tsai, quite a bit, completely independent of uh, loop quadrupole. Right, right. Mm -hmm. but, but as far as I know, they don't, I mean, it's a different mechanism, it's not this non Gaussian modulation. Right, but I, but I would say it uh, just, it is uh, several years earlier. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, yeah. I, am not, I am not the first one trying to explain the, the Suppression. But I will insist that I am what I am looking for is a simultaneous explanation of suppression dipolar and this uh, using non Gaussian modulation. So at the, I have a much more philosophical question. At the beginning, you said it's convenient to interpret uh, the phi as a relational clock. Now, you know, convenience is one thing, but I'm interested in truth. <laughs> so I, what I want to know is how time really, what it would take to see time emerge uh, in, in that picture. It's, it may be convenient, and yes, you can then sort of tell a narrative about how, you know, the evolution of the universe, but, but, but more realistically, how do you see time uh, emerge? Right. That's, a very good, that's a very good question, deep question that, that everybody tries to answer in precise terms. I can tell you uh, what these formalities uh, uh, tells us. And, uh, you know, we have two levels. Uh, one is at the level of the of the wave function of the Freeman, the homogeneous degrees of freedom, just Freeman, Robinson Walker with, with homogeneous matter. And here, uh, you know, this is just an interpretation which is convenient for your intuition if you wish. You don't need to do it, and there is, I mean, you can disagree, and uh, we can disagree that we disagree, and nobody will be. Will be put in act. So here, and, and, you know, is you know, speaking about causality just with these degrees of freedom is difficult. So I don't see any objective manner of, of, of speaking about time here. But with perturbations, it's different. So if you introduce perturbations at the quantum level and then neglect back reaction, it happens that the propagation of perturbations in the full, you know, in in, in loop quantum cosmology happens to be described by equations in which an effective metric appears with effective light cones. So if you are one of these perturbations, you will see a time direction, you will see a classical metric, you know, a smooth metric, not classical, but a smooth metric with well-defined light cones and arrows of time. So at this level, quantum fields living on that geometry, they feel as if there is a causal structure and a time, a time evolution. So to me, this is one of the ways in which uh, time can emerge. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would like to mention an analogy to, to address your question. So today we measure time in terms of the temperature of the microwave background. So we have a matter clock which is evolving in the universe. And this is a thing that is setting our time. So I think this is the way that you should also interpret what we saw here. Here it's the phi, which, which is the matter clock, which is giving the time. So just to clarify, so the metric that is appearing there, therefore, has the, the phi acting as time. This, this GAB has your scalar field acting. No, no. Here, no. Here no. I have done the exercise. Okay. I have done an intermediate step which is uh, what I was describing here. So you initially have the scalar field as a function of phi, and you can interpret phi as a time, as a clock. But now, you know, 
What about if I want to write equations like this, in which phi itself is long? Uh, so I'm going to now go beyond this interpretation. So I'm going, I'm going to introduce a parameter t <coughs> that, that I'm going to call time. And of course, it's related to the scalar field. They grow monotonically, so it's a, a, a good time, as good as the scalar field itself. But <coughs> So I introduce this time t, which is a monotonic function of phi, and the the statement is that there is a choice of that function t for which these equations become true. And you recover the standard equation that we have in GR, where you have a t and you have a scalar field evolving with that t. Okay. So you, have, you, you can choose you know, what picture you like more. At the fundamental level, I think about the scalar field phi. To me, that is the most physical way of measuring time, using matter, as, as Robert just explained. But if you ask me, OK, can you? Reproduce equations like the GR in which we have a time t parameter, I would say, okay, yes, this is a mathematical exercise. Let me introduce this function t. And there is a choice for which these equations become true, and this is what in GR we call time. Okay. But, but when you but when you reach time, okay, there's a, there's a key. Sorry. Yes, I have it. So it was a finger, sorry. Okay, okay. Is it, are you following up on this, or is it a new question? No, no. Okay, so... It's <laughs> <laughs> so, so. a new question, there is, there is, there is a whole bunch of people... Yeah, No, well, I... Wait, my head. Well, when we do, and he do. No, okay. Yeah, right. I'll make the question quick, okay. and I think maybe Robert answered it. The question is, the solution to the large-scale anomalies that you get presumably out of this bounds, how dependent on, on a loop quantum gravity analysis is this? Or can we get a solution in other sort of bounce scenarios like in string theory? And I think your answer was yes. So right. that's why I'm clear. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let me differentiate two things. One, I mean, there are many proposals to account for this, uh, for one or several of these uh, anomalies. I don't know any proposal uh, uh, addressing more than one simultaneously. And a bounce, you know, having some features can, you know, with some mechanisms, address one of them, uh, you know, the suppression, as Robert was pointing out. So here, uh, what I say is, 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 is different. It's a different mechanism, and I didn't have time to say that the mechanism has nothing to do with loop quantum cosmology. In fact, the analysis I was going to show you is for a generic bounce, and doesn't matter if the bounce is coming from loop quantum cosmology, from modified gravity, or for something else. You know, any bounce through this non-Gaussian modulation can account for several of these anomalies simultaneously. There is another mechanism that, that one can find from a bounce, generic bounce, uh, to account for this. And I insist, you know, my goal was to try to, to produce more than one simultaneously. That has nothing to do with loop quantum cosmology, really. All what we need is a, is a bounce. Yeah, uh, so as I said yesterday, and this I would like to, to, to point that out again, uh, the CMP data have been analyzed uh, within the framework of Lambda CDN. So these anomalies to me show that somewhere the Lambda CDN model is inconsistent with the data. So I find it a bit dangerous to just jump uh, in another model, which is a modified gravity model. Within this framework, the CMP data have not been analyzed and then to try to extract the results from this model for something that has been found within Lambda CDN. Right. So to me, it just shows a crack of the consistency of the model. So uh, I don't want you know, to somehow uh, uh, say something negative for all this work. It's a positive thing what you're doing, but we have to keep in mind that probably something may be a bit uh, inconsistent there. Thank you. I, I fully agree with that. And in fact, the approach that one has to follow is not to take the value of these parameters that are extracted with the lambda CDN theory and then explain them with a... I, I don't think that is the right way of doing it. Would we agree? So, we agree. so, but the way I try to do it is going to the data, having a new uh, template for, for the theory and trying to extract from the data, the glass is going to bounce, <laughs> from the data, uh, the constraints, and to see if this new model uh, fits better the data than the lambda CDN model. I fully agree with you. One has to put away the theory that doesn't work and, and contrast data with a new model. Thank you. So, yes. okay. 
We have time for two questions first. I won't forget you. <laughs> yeah, can you remind me uh, why you need inflation in this case and you cannot explain you know, the cosmological power spectrum just uh, using the bouncing scenario coming from uh, the quantum cosmology? I think they should know already, but. No, I mean, um, the statement, you know, there are proposals to account. So there are proposals by, by Robert in particular to use a matter bounce to account for, 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 for the CMD. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I mean, why does it work? Uh, so here you could introduce some matter fields uh, such that in the contracting phase you have a matter dominated phase and follow the same uh, path. And, and people have done that. Yeah, well, Wilson Ewing has considered that. So, so this, but, but you can do that or you can have inflation after, after the bounce. So there are two possibilities. The bounce itself doesn't generate a scale invariant spectrum. That's the point. You need something else. The bounce itself cannot produce a, almost a scale invariant spectrum. You need either a pre-inflation, a pre-bounce phase of matter domination, or a post-bound phase of inflation, or something else. <coughs> no, maybe just okay. Question. So the first my comment just in this respect of uh, discussion of times. Okay, I would say that there exist um, uh, uh, different, uh, different clocks which may measure different times. So, okay, um, looking, uh, as Robert said, looking at the behavior of a temperature, we may uh, measure evolution in terms of a scale factor. But we, but we have the uh, usual atomic clocks which measure which measure proper time, uh, and also in the cause of you know, inflation, indeed, as well as for general expressions, um, it's, be, it's duration in terms of defaults, it's just the generating functions for perturbation, so scale factor change in the cause of inflation is a, is a, is a clock for, uh, 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 so, uh, Perturbation actually is a clock which measures the scale factor. But we can uh, well um, assume existence of some uh, very massive particles and through a change of its uh, uh, wave function, the phase of its, its wave function will measure, will measure cosmic times. And the, the third time, the third type of clock in the course of which is also used in the purpose of inflation, is some hypothetical scalar fields, light scalar fields, which measure in our time. Actually, the integral of h cube dt. So, what's more, we have different clocks which measure different, different physical process which and compare, compare with different clocks, we can extract many information. And also, and finally, I have simply one question, question to you. If you look at the same um, picture of the, 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 of the two multiples, um, uh, uh, equal to plus integral, but if you look at the octopole, octopole is just the opposite, anomalously high. Not so much anomalously high as the quadrupole is low, but uh, still it's high. So if you assume, I would say, if one assume some Mm. If not consider, it is done usually uh, with simply as a fluctuation, uh, which it happened by chance, but try to assume some um, importance. I would say one should not neglect <laughs> the, the fact that, as I say, not only quadruple is a low, but octuple is uh, 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 enormously high. That was a comment or a question? Well, in some sense, a question, if your model predicts anomalously high octopole. No. So, uh, let's thank again our speaker.